the horror genre had seen its most successful years yet in the early to mid-1930s, with audiences flocking in droves to see their favourite monsters on the screen. But what goes up must come down. That six-year boom would be followed by a brief but very steep decline in 1937 and 1938. Stricter censors from the likes of conservative Catholic Joseph Blean of the MPAA threatened to strangle the genre. Now, without the approval of the board, a film could not be distributed and studios could face financial ruin by investing in darker material. In Britain, a new classification of H for Horrific was introduced on January 1st, 1937, intended to act as an advisory caution regarding attendance of younger viewers. Some local councils abused this, and took the new rating as a strict ban on audiences under 16, further damaging profits. Consequently, the horror genre took a big hit in the West. Meanwhile, over in Asia, Ma Shu Weibang carefully navigated his country's own censorship laws to produce and release China's first horror film, Song at Midnight. Song at Midnight uses the Phantom of the Opera as its foundation. It builds upon the French novel by adding a significant political subplot, which drastically affects the tone of the story, as well as the Phantom himself. Therefore, this film can be seen as the very first sound version of the Phantom of the Opera, beating out Universal's 1940s remake by several years. In this iteration, the Phantom haunts an old theatre and keeps himself hidden, but sings to a lonely and mentally distant woman every night. When a touring troupe of actors stop in at the decrepit theatre, the Phantom does not single out a Christine Daae type, but focuses on her male equivalent. This singer struggles with a new solo, but the Phantom offers his assistance and tutelage from the shadows. With the Phantom's help, the singer becomes accomplished and wishes to express his gratitude in person. It is here that we learn of this phantom's distinctly different backstory. A decade prior, he was a left-wing revolutionary, using his theatre performances as a form of political speech. He is successful, talented, handsome and strong-willed. However, trouble with the authorities and the father of his love interest beat him down. Eventually, a romantic rival attacks him on the street with nitric acid, hideously disfiguring his face and hands. Rather than return to his love in this form, he spreads the rumours of his own death. The news cripples the woman, who is revealed as the lady who is comforted by his nightly singing. It is interesting to note the western influences on this film. From the European source material, to the ending which is straight out of a Hollywood horror. Though Song at Midnight lacks any horror figures from Chinese folklore, there are still differences that separate the film from those movies in the west. The plot deepens as the Phantom employs the singer to essentially act as his proxy, to take over the life he lost a decade ago in order to bring comfort and happiness back to his tragic lover. This is in stark contrast to almost every western horror, where the monster figure seeks to intervene and break up a relationship in order to claim the girl for himself. The anti-war themes relating both to the conflicts of recent memory and to anxieties of wars yet to happen come across as very personal to the filmmakers and to the nation at that time. The left wing called Arms for concludes the film is tailored specifically to the audience of China at that moment in time. Sadly, the film was all too timely, releasing just before the Second Sino-Japanese War, a major conflict that bled directly into World War II. Song at Midnight still became a national phenomenon, receiving a sequel and a slew of remakes, including a 1995 version directed by Roddy Yu before he ventured over to America to direct Bride of Chucky and Freddy vs. Jason. The 1937 original remains beloved in its home country. The directing style could be considered a bit flat, but otherwise it is a strong effort. An air of melancholy seeps through every frame. This is perhaps the most sympathetic version of the Phantom that exists on film. The acid attack scene, and the character's distressed whimpering afterwards, are genuinely harrowing. The film pauses regularly to slow down and focus on the music, showing some songs in full. The sad operatic tunes only add to the melancholy, 
while the lyrics push the film's agenda. On a more creative note, there's a wonderful scene where our protagonist is searching for the phantom, and every footstep he makes is met with the key of a piano. This crescendos into a cacophony of angry, scary sound when the phantom is shown at last. Moments of the phantom's rage and terror are few and far between, but are all the more powerful for that reason. There is even a scene which plays out like an early jump scare. It is not as outwardly entertaining or easy to watch as Hollywood horrors of that era, but it's interesting to understand the worldwide appeal of classic horror, while remaining a very intriguing film in its own standing. <laughs> 